Okay, please take your seats. Okay, so it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, uh, Professor Andrei Okunkov from uh, Columbia University in New York. Professor Okunkov studied at the Moscow State University from which he received his bachelor degree and doctorate in mathematics in 1995, then taught at the University of Chicago, UC Berkeley, Princeton University, and he is uh, currently the Samuel Eilenberg Professor of Mathematics at uh, Columbia University. So, Professor Kukov was a recipient of a prestigious Sloan Research Fellowship and Packard Fellowships. He received the prize of European Mathematical uh, Society in 2004. And most notably, he was awarded the Fields Medal in 2006, which is often uh, said to be the analog of Nobel Prize in uh, mathematics, uh, for his uh, contributions to bridging probability, representation theory, and algebraic geometry. Uh, since then, partly in collaboration uh, uh, with uh, De Krasov, Panari Pandey, and Molik, and many others, he has formulated some striking conjectures in enumerative geometry, which were largely motivated by string theory reasoning, and have since then been vigorously established. So it's an excellent illustration of the interactions that take place between uh, these two fields. So uh, today he will tell us about analytic properties of uh, a class of special functions which play a central role in mathematical physics and in string theory. Um, I had a sneak preview of his slides and I should warn you it will be a little bit more advanced than the previous talk we heard. But I think the first half of the talk should be accessible to undergrad students and, and then uh, that's all for the best. So, Prof, uh, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, thanks again for inviting our invitation and uh, Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Boris. I, it's real. It's a real honor to uh, to be speaking, uh, addressing this audience. I see the general Paris audience is not quite what I expected. Many of you wear the conference badges, and uh, many of you are. <laughs> the first half of the talk to which Boris was referring includes the explanation what's a complex number, and so if you'd rather scroll along, or if you lost and want to go back. Then you, there's the, the, the slides are posted on my website. Well, not on my website. If you go, if you type this, you'll see the slides. And you can, like I said, you can go using your devices. Uh, uh, you, can, you can go stroll forward and backward. And so um, I'll start with, uh, with uh, it's probably Aristotle said that. Or, so that uh, most things in life are not given to us all at once. But can you, can you read my handwriting? Yeah. And <clears throat> so an example of this, for example, number E, very important number in mathematics. So first of all, it's given by its decimal expansion, which means, so decimal expansion of a number means you have 2, then 7 over 2, then most of you know this, then 1 over 100, and so forth. Of course, if you, if you look at it like this, it looks the, the terms of this expansion look rather random. But the way it comes in mathematics, again, in the, is an infinite series. You have to sum infinite series, which is sum over inverse factorials. And a factorial of a number is a product of all numbers. So factorial, n factorial is a product of all numbers up to n. And this is, this you can do on your, uh, every, every cell phone now has a calculator. You can, you can see how fast this series converges. You can get it with arbitrary with very good accuracy with a few terms, but, but it always be approximation. The number will not be given to you, you know, somehow. It will require infinitely many steps to, to get there. And, and if we want just, just a number, just a particular number, still, still uh, that number is often a value of, a very dis of an important function for uh, an important value of this argument. Well, for example, e is the, well, the way it's, it's how the exponential function is defined, that e is its value at one. And the exponential function is sum of the series. And here, of course, x could be a number. It also could be a matrix, because matrix you can square, 
and the cube and so forth, and you can add them up if it's a square matrix. Uh, or it could be a complex number. I'll, like I said, I'll define what a complex number is in a second. Uh, e is uh, maybe not the most famous number in mathematics. Maybe pi is the most famous. There's no E day as far as I can tell, but there is a pi day. On, uh, and, and pi, of course, this you can also get as a series. is a value of, for example, is a value of, ta of arc tangent. Or this is, I mean, the computation of number pi is a, is a, is a, is a very developed branch in mathematics. This is not, by far, not the, the way to compute it. But still, if, uh, for example, pi is 6 times arctangent 1 over square root 3, for example, and uh, the series for arctangent is this series, you see the difference. Uh, here, the denominators, they're, they're factorial, so, so they grow very fast. Here, the number 3, where constant denominators go pretty slow. But still, if you, only, if you take 200 terms of this series, you'll get pi with 100 digits accuracy. So, but you're not going to get the whole thing at once. And so uh, this is very much an issue in string theory, where uh, the result, the result of physical interaction, is, is an infinite sum. You have to sum over all possible genera of the, the string, the world sheet of a string. So Hiroshi already explained what a, a, a string theory postulates that your fundamental object is not a, a particle rather than a, rather a string. And so it, the world, instead of being, instead of a word line of a particle, you have a world sheet of a string. And then you can, so this, that, have, that can have arbitrary genus. The genus is the number of holes. And they all contribute. They all contribute. So there's a, it's an infinite series. They all contribute. The, and the, the in front, as the genus grows, you have to multiply by a, a certain constant, which, 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 uh, which measures the intensity of, you know, when the two strings come together and form one, the intensity of this process. And so, uh, and so if you want the, the whole answer, then you have, to, you have to sum this thing up. And uh, as already what I think was implicit or explicit in, in Hiroshi's talk, in Professor Aguri's talk, then uh, the, in the, even though G, you, you know, in, in school physics you learn that fundamental constants of nature is a constant, but in fact, a physicist or mathematical physicist think of them as variables and so you should really, you would really want to study this as a function of that, of that variable g. And so, and, uh, and so we're facing a uh, really ageless problem in mathematics to say something global about things defined by a power series. So this is, and when we look at the power series, power series is a sum with some coefficient cn, which of, uh, you take some, some variables z to the n, you sum this thing up. And uh, in particular, we'll be doing this not only for real values of z, but also for complex values. means a complex number is a, is a, is a combination of x times i, x and one real number, i times y, another real number, and i is a number such as squares minus one. And using the usual rules of algebra, so you can certainly make sense out of, out of, uh, out of this expansion. We'll, uh, and in, if an, even if one wants to compute, even one wants to compute things at the, for real values of parameters, it's still of immense, it's still immensely useful to know what the function does for complex. We'll see, we'll see examples of that. Okay. Everybody with me? So a very general fact about the series, so we have a, a series like this, a little of some water. So a very general fact about series, power series, is that they have a certain radius of convergence. So if I take a complex number, so x, z, x plus i, y, and I plot it as a, as a, plot it as a vector on a plane, then there'll be a certain circle such that if I plug a number inside that circle, the series converges. If I plug it outside that circle, the series diverges. And the size of that circle is, is roughly captures the how 
the exponential growth of the coefficients of my power series. So, in, so if, the, if the coefficients grow roughly like one over, so the radius of convergence being r means that the coefficients grow like one, the nth coefficient grows or decays, this could be number less or bigger than one, grows as one over r to the power n. And the, the way to think about it is just think about the expansion of geometric series. You think, you look at this infinite, so this is, this, this is an infinite geometric series, and we learn how to sum up the infinite geometric series, it becomes this fraction. And this fraction, the series converges precisely if, if the absolute value of z is less than, than, than r, and so this, in the coefficients of this, you know, have exact that grade of growth, this, this, this all makes sense. And so in particular, if we look at the exponential function, which we already discussed, this, this will have an infinite radius of convergence because, because the denominators here are the factorials, and, and they grow faster than any, so, so if I, it means if you, you look at n factorial, and as n grows, you multiply by larger and larger numbers. So this will grow faster than any exponential of any given number. And so their series converges uh, for all values of parameters. This, of course, never going to happen with string series. So, so this is, but still, we, it is a very useful function to study. And one thing you can, you, you, um, you can observe about this function, just by expanding the series, if you expand the series for x plus i y, you see just by the rules of algebra and comparing what you know the series for cosine and sine, you'll see that this is exponential of a complex number is in fact, is it has some part which is just exponential of the real part and then this trigonometric part. And then this means this exponential function, so like I said, this series is defined for any complex number. And what it does, it takes Cartesian coordinates on the plane to polar coordinates on the plane. Right? So, so if I look at the, at this, uh, at the lines where, where imaginary part is fixed, then this will go to radii, and the lines where the, the, lines where the real part is fixed go to, to, uh, to the circles. And in particular, you'll discover this fact that uh, Euler discovered. Well, so most talks in this, most most facts in this talk are uh, were either known to Euler or, or. Uh, or you know, been just still conjecture, or maybe. <laughs> so you discover this amazing fact that if I plug this exponential of two pi i, this is going to be one. It means if I go, if I go, if I here take, just go along the imaginary axis. Here I'm going around the, here I'm going around the unit circle, and if I, and here, here I complete, I complete this unit circle here. And, and here I am up to 2 pi i. And <clears throat> this says on something interesting about the inverse of exponential function, which is natural logarithm. And if, you've, uh, if you're, um, I know for a fact some of you don't know. I mean, I know at least one person in the audience who doesn't know what the logarithm of a negative number is. And so, and so you're, if you're wondering what was the logarithm of a negative number, well, this, this is very hard to understand in, in, uh, if you stay within the real numbers, but, for, but uh, here you see that this is going to be just a, a complex number with imaginary, part, with imaginary part, which equals to pi i, because you need exactly, you need exactly pi i radians to come to, to the negative axis. And, and more importantly, you see that not only the logarithm of any complex number is defined, in fact, that, that function, the logarithm, is defined up to addition to, to pi i, because if I, if I change, if I, if I add 2 pi i to, to in the exponential, it does nothing. And so the, the graph of the logarithm, sorry, the graph of the logarithm, it looks rather than so the graph of the logarithm, it's a function which looks like a, 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 a circle of staircase, which any Parisian building has, and in particular used one just to descend from the first floor, from the ground floor to, to here. And so if you, meaning, meaning if I go around the circle, I don't, uh, I don't come up where I was, but I, I come to the next floor. And so, this, so if I go around the circle, the, the logarithm, the function logarithm changes by 2 pi i. This is the, this is the, 
This is the phenomenon of monodrum. And so we'll come, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. This whole talk about that, you have some analytic function such that if you, if, you, if, you, if you follow the argument of this analytic function along a curve, and come back to where you started, you get a different value. You thought you, you, you'd completed, you thought you are going up a uh, uh, circle staircase, you, or spiral staircase, you thought you completed a turn, but in fact, you, in fact, you were on the next floor or, or on the previous floor. And so our next example is the series, again, again, the very familiar series, is if I just take this power series, the, the Newton binomial formula. So by, by uh, I don't know, probably was known before Newton, I'm sure. And so anyway, I attached, Newton's name is attached to it. But if I take a power, this is the expansion of the series, it says this form. And this, this, well, how big are the terms of the series? You see that this is, if I take the third, the third, the third, say, the third term of this, here's the product of number from one to three, and here's the product of number from a to a plus two. And so you think, well, this should, this super exponential growth of the, or of the, of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the factorial, then the numerator and denominator should roughly cancel, and, and they do. And so this, uh, the terms of the series, instead of growing exponent, instead of growing super expansion, in fact, they grow just polynomially, means, means the radius of convergence is one, which is, and this is a very important principle, of course, the radius of convergence is the distance from where you, from the origin where you expand the series to the first singular point, and that the first singular point is clearly one, because if, I, if say, A is negative, or say, A is positive, sorry, if A is positive, you're gonna get you know, you, you'll be dividing by zero if you try to plug z equals one. So this, this series defines a function inside of circle of radius one. On the other hand, we can certainly, compu we can certainly compute this, this, form, this function by this formula for any complex number, which is not one, except, except that uh, the function log here is defined only up to two pi i, as we discussed. And therefore, this function, if we use this formula to define our function, then, then we'll have an ambiguity with the exponential of two pi i times a. Okay. So now we come to diff somehow maybe this is, this is, uh, this is the, main, the main point of, the main definition of this talk is that, so here we have a, a radius of, this is our radius of conversion, one in this example. Inside that radius of conversion, we have a function defined by a power series, and we have a convergent power series. We can plug any number we want, and we'll get, in, uh, with sum up the infinite series, we'll get the answer. And then, what can happen is that we have a different formula that extends this function beyond the radius of conversion, but that formula may be multivalued, like in, in, this, in the example we're currently discussing. So this, is, this, this function, you can equate other to this series, which is single valid instead of its radius and convergence. Or you can write it like this, and then it'll, it'll, have, it'll have branching, as mathematicians say. And so the result is that you have this single valid function, and then if you follow the function for, for argument going around the singularity, this is like two particles in Hiroshi's talk going around, going around the center of ma uh, a, a, a mass point in, in general relativity. <laughs> what you will find, you will find the, the two expressions you're gonna get on following the two sides of the singularity, you're gonna get different expressions. And, and quite precisely, the discrepancy, discrepancy here will be exactly exponential of two pi i a. And so this is mathematicians say that, that first, so this is used in terms of first, this series has analytic continuation, means there's some other formulas that extend the, the same function outside, outside of the domain where it was originally defined by series. And this is, this is, this is, uh, this is, you know, it's 
Normally, it doesn't happen. If you write a random series, it will not have analytic continuation. And second, that analytic continuation has monodromy in that if you, if, you, if you follow two different paths, the result not exactly agree. They differ. And the way they differ here, they differ by a factor of exponential 2 pi i. Already in this baby example, we can understand some very basic features of the theory in that if the monodrome is trivial, so I should say that the term monodrome was uh, apparently coined by Riemann, and for him, monodrome really means meant absence of monodrome. When he said something with monodrome, monodrome has the word mon on it, means one, and he really, he really meant the monodrome is when it's when, anyway, things, ch things tend to change their meaning as, uh, as life goes on. Anyway, many what? Many drum, exactly. It should be many drum, yeah. The monodrum is trivial. What does it happen? It just means you go around and things don't differ. It means that factor by which they differ is one. So the exponential of 2 pi i is one. Well, we studied this function, and we figured that this happens exactly when a is an integer. If a is an integer, the original function is a rational function. So it's kind of a very important statement. You have something without monodromy, with a certain gross condition and singularity, but this is, this, is, this is not for a public talk, then it is a rational function. And second, if two things, to look again at this, at this transparency, if two things have the same monodromy, means here they differ. So if you have two different functions for two different values of A, if they have the same monodromy, that means they differ by multiplication by a rational function. Is that clear? Two different such things. If they have the same monodromy, then in fact one is a rational function multiple the other. Rational functions have no monodrome. Rational functions, you, I mean, rational functions, you have some you know, new polynomial in Z divided by another polynomial in Z that's well-defined single valued as long as you don't dividing by zero. And it's a, again, it's a very general principle that monodromy of a special function determines is uniquely up to rational function. It's very powerful. So I think it was first used by Rima. Slightly more generally, if instead of, so we, we studied, I apologize, we studied the properties of this function. And then if we take a product of such things, it's clear what's going to happen is that if I, this will have many, so this, this, each factor has a singularity in, in its own complex plane somewhere. The radius convergence is the distance to the shortest, closest singularity. And as I, this will have this formula, just like before, we'll have an analytic continuation. And an analytic continuation will be picking up a factor of 2 pi i ai. Ai is the exponent here as you go, as you wind around any of these things. So a very special feature of this in the previous example is the transformation. So you have a, you have a function. You go around some singularity, and it stays the same function up to a multiple. You can imagine a situation where instead of staying the same function, it transforms in some finite dimensional space of functions. Functions, you know, you can add and multi you can add functions, you can multiply function by numbers. And this, uh, so functions are a vector space. It'll be a notion, notion of a vector space will be important in what follows. And instead of this vector space being one dimensional, means all possible functions are multiples of a single one. You can have a situation when there's a finite dimensional space of function and you have some transformation. And so to see an example of this, well, let's look at hypergeometric function. Again, it was known to Euler, although it's called Gauss hypergeometric function. And um, so this is, this must be uh, erratic. Uh, this, is, this doesn't belong there. It's just I touched the, the surface of the. So 
So this is the way it's defined is that it's a series just like before. So we had an example. So maybe, maybe to orient it before, if two, this depends on three parameters, A, B, and C. If the two of them are equal, we get the, the series we just studied. And so this is, again, a sum over the power series. And the nth term, nth coefficient, the power series in that, nth coefficient is a ratio of the kind of things we saw in this binomial formula. Namely, if we define this called Pohammer symbol, it's defined as, defined as a product of all numbers, of n consecutive numbers starting with A. And it, it's actually very convenient to write this object as a ratio of two gamma functions. Gamma function is a remarkable function in mathematics. It generalizes factorial. We, we saw factorials many times already in this talk. So in particular, a gamma function is the generalization. And then solves this equation. So if I take a times gamma of a, you get gamma of a plus 1. And gamma of 1 is, is 1. And so in particular, gamma of n plus 1, therefore, will be n factorial. So then if you, if you use this equation n times, or, or maybe n minus 1 times, then, then you'll see that this is, this is the product I claim it is. And as before, the series has, uh, again, the, you, have, you have two things which grow super exponentially on top, two things that grow super exponentially in the bottom. They more or less cancel each other. So things only grow polynomially, then grows. And so this radius of convergence of the series, again, 1. And to see its analytic continuation, it's very convenient to write the series as integrals, the Euler did. So first, you have to normalize the series in a nice way. And so you have to multiply it by a suitable combination of gamma functions. This is actually very important. This, uh, well, this gamma function will probably come up later in the talk. And then it's given by an integral of, so, so, so this, this is, this integral, under this integral, we see the kind of function we just discussed. It's a product of linear functions of the argument raised to various, so we got here. So what, what is this? This is a product of linear functions of z raised to various complex powers. And so here, we see a product, again, the integration variable is t. You have a product of linear functions in T raised to various complex powers. And we and this the this function here has singularities at t equals zero, t equal one, and t equals one over z. And we're integrating in T from one singularity to another. So, so the picture is like this, there's a complex plane. There are singularities at zero, one, one over z, and also at infinity, but infinity didn't fit on the slide. And, and, and what we're doing, we're integrating, we're integrating this expression from 0 to 1. In the basic fact about integration in, 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 of, in complex plane is that it doesn't depend on how, you, how exact path of the integration, as long as, you, as long as it doesn't cross the singularity. So but that will, will, will take a path of integration that goes roughly along the real axis. I, I just draw it a little bit down so that you see it just joined from the real axis. And the, the, the formula is, it's like a, a, a plat de serre. So the formula is that the monodromy of the integral is sum of two, I mean, essentially sum of two things. It's, it's monodromy of what you have under the integral sign, and we figure that out, plus the, the flexibility or ambiguity in choosing the path of the integration. And so to see this concretely, let's go on the side. Suppose, so here, so this, these are the singularities of my function. Again, 0, 1, and 1 over z. They, we integrate from here to here. And now suppose z, z is the variable in which, z is the variable of the function. So we had a function, maybe I should make it clear here. Here, z is the argument of the hypergeometric function. From the point of this integral, it's, it's a parameter. It's a location of one of the singularities. The integration variable dt, it's a, it's a dummy variable. We, it, it's going to come out of the integral. And the, the thing will then depend on z. So we're studying monodromy in z. So now let's suppose z goes around the singularity. z goes around z equals 1, for example. So what's going to happen? So 
So if z goes around 1, then 1 over z also goes around 1. So 1 over z tries to go around 1, it will pull the path of integration with it, because the path of integration is not allowed to cross the singularity. So this is, this is a sequence of events. The uh, 1 over z pulls the path of integration further and further. And as I complete the circle, what I'll get, I'll get an extra bubble. So the result of analytic continuation of my original integral, this one, is, is still the original integral plus something, and that plus is that bubble. If I go, I go, I go integrate here. That, that clear? Everybody got that? You got that? <laughs> yeah, so that's fun, I think. So, so now, so so far we so far we used only the fact that that the the we can integrate along any path we want as long as it doesn't cross the singularity. We haven't used we had just used the um, we used the ambiguity in the choice of the integration path. Now we're going to use actual properties of the integral. So the properties of the integral, if I integrate from here to here, well, I can, I can pull that integral. So if I, sorry, I integrate around this loop. And I can pull that, that loop as tight as I can going around the singularity. So I can imagine, you can imagine this loop being pulled tight, you know, kind of zero, just like two infinitesimal things here. Except that my integrand, the function I'm integrating, if I go around the singularity, it's not going to come back to itself. This is a function we just studied. If I go around singularity, it picks up a factor. So the difference of my integrand on one side of this loop and on the other side of this loop is this 1 minus this exponential. So what I can do is I can trade this loop for 1 minus the exponential times the integral from just here to there. Make sense? So the result there is that analytic continuation of my original integral is the old integral plus the, plus the integral from here to here with this factor. So if I, if I integrate from one singularity to another, analytically continue, I get integral from some other singularity to some other singularity with a factor. And, and that factor, so there's important observations, is that these factors are polynomials, or more precisely, Roland polynomials, in the exponential, in the monodromies of my integrand, which are the exponentials of 2 pi i a, 2 pi i b, and 2 pi i c. And in fact, those are polynomials with integer coefficients. So the monodromic matrices is going to be written as two by two matrices with Laurent polynomials with integer coefficients in, in, the parameters, in the parameters of my original equation. And how would be the size of this matrix? Well, the all possible integrals I can get, they all, the, linear, the independent ones are just this one, from 0 to 1 and 1 from here. So it'll be two by two. You can easily see that the, everything else you can express in terms of this. So there'll be two by two matrices, each Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients in the parameters of my equation. So this is extremely special. Maybe I'll, I, uh, since uh, we have, how am I doing on time? Oh, have time, yes, so that was plenty of time. So then, uh, so if you write a random series like we discussed, a random series, this will not have any kind of analytic continuation. If you write a special series, this will have an analytic continuation, but that but that still, as a function of parameter, could be a very complicated function of parameters. It, it's very special what happens here for this hypergeometric function is that, that as a function of parameters, it's in fact a very, very nice function. And so <coughs> the, you see that something 
particular nice happening for hybrid geometric function, you can ask generalizations. And there are many generalizations, there are vast generalizations of notion hypergeometric function. I'm not going to go over them. Roughly speaking, they're either multivariate, so you have we had a sum or an integral. You can write a multivariate sum with a bunch you know, with the, the terms being ratios of gamma functions, and you can write an integral, big, you know, multivariate integral of the kind of the kind we considered. And in principle, if you any such object. In principle, you can investigate. There's, there's, in principle, you can investigate in monodromy. And this monodromy will be computed as a, as a collection of matrices depending polynomially on exponential of the parameter. So this is, on the one side, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible improvement. It's not a very, it's not a random function. It's, mon it's monodromy is something very, very structured. So if you take a, like I said, you have the matrix of, of Laurent polynomials with integer coefficients on parameter of your problem, exponential parameters of your problem. On the other hand, this, if you work it out in examples, this is heavy stuff. I mean, if you, if you actually work it out, it, it's very hard and it requires, well, I mean, any, any such computation, I mean, this, this hypergeometric function, tends, the way it's defined, they're defined in families, arbitrarily complicated. Any one of them is going to give you some complicated matrix. And you know, to do that all, it sounds like, sounds like, uh, sounds like an infinitely complicated problem. Like, it's, it's like, in, again, in the previous talk, it's like this, it's a problem that, that you, you sum it up, you should get an infinitely bright sky or infinitely complicated problem. So it's really heavy stuff, and one needs to some global understanding, some synthetic understanding. And in in a situation of great practical interest, such synthetic understanding was uh, rests on the idea of categorification. So this is a kind of a like I said. Now we go from now we go from Euler to to present day, and this is uh, or more or less present day. And, and this idea is deep and, and, and technical, and uh, I'm gonna and powerful too. And so I'll, uh, I'll 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 try my best to explain it. And the explanation is as follows. So <coughs> so fix. Well, let's think of uh, first thing. I'm field. Field is uh, it's like real numbers or complex numbers. Something where you can add, multiply, and divide. So then then. Once you have a field, then you can ask for, talk about algebras over that field, such as, uh, for example, matrices. If you have matrices with entries in some field, you can, you can add and multiply them. Or you can take the group algebra of some group, meaning you add the elements of the group formally, and you multiply them as, as you multiply them in the group. For example, a group of permutation will be important group and not for our purposes. So that means permutation, you have n objects, you can permute them in any way you like. For example, you can think n variables, you permute them n variables in any way you like. So this permutation you compose, that's the group law in, that's the group law in, the, in, the, uh, in the group. And then you can just take formal sums of permutation, you know how to multiply them. Another algebra, just polynomials in n variables. We all know how to add and multiply. I assume we've by now learned what, how to add and multiply polynomials. And the algebra which I denote the star, this will be important algebra for us today, is where you take polynomials in two n variables and you marry it with a symmetric group. You also have operators for permutation. And what these guys do, they permute simultaneously first n variables and the second n variables in the same way. So if you permute x1 and x2, they also permute y1 and y2. Is that, is that clear? And the module over an algebra is, is by definition a vector space with an action of this algebra by matrices there. Or for example, if I take, if I take a, a matrix algebra, that this n-dimensional space, by definition, a module over this algebra. If I take, uh, if I take my third example here, 
then the module of this algebra is, is a vector space with n commuting operators. So I have to assign how each x acts, and, and, they, uh, and uh, this means, means I have uh, n operators that commute. Make sense? And so this, the, the, main, the main difficulty in the study of modules is, be, is in some module you can have such basics, maybe I'll put here, Means, means my matrices act by some uh, matrix, but my algebra elements act by some matrices. And it may be the case that, that it has a submodule, namely in some basis, there's a, some subspace that's actually preserved. So my matrices act, there's some subspace that's preserved, and then it will also act on the quotient space. But the point is that this, is, this can be also non-trivial stuff going on here. So if I have a, a a, you know, something could be a sub some sub module could be a, a some module could be a sub module of some other module in, in complicated ways. And to um, to get rid of this, one introduces uh, a notion of Grothendieck group, where you precisely mod out by say so you take just a free abelian group generated by the relation where where you take where the class of a module equals to the class of sub module plus the quotient module. Just forget. Let's just kill this. There could be there could be you know, there there could be some complicated stuff going on here. But we'll forget. And people people like doing this, for example, because because if you if you're interested in 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 characters, this is the traces of this matrices. Of course, the trace of this matrix, trace of the sum of diagonal eigenvalues, that will certainly not see what's going on here. So if you're just interested in computing traces, you're not you're not worried about that. So this is called the k-group. And if the algebra is graded, graded means you assign labels, you have, a, it's a, you have you start degrees to so your elements, such that when you multiply the degrees add, then we can simul simultaneously require the module to be graded. Namely, module also, you, uh, you assign some degrees to elements in the module, such that when you act, but in my algebra, if I act an element of degree d on a module with element with degree d prime, the result should have degree d plus d prime. And that grading could be by, by integers or by an n tuple of integers. So here, here I wrote m tuple of integers. That means it's, a, it's a, you know, m tuple of integers. You have to add them up here. And so then, then you have an operation which just shifts grading. You take, take a module. And you just reassign the grade. It's like it's like in grading in, uh, you know, all of. Uh, sorry, not we're we're in France. Some of us teach, and so, and so, uh, sometimes you end up with the with the grade distribution where everybody in the class, you know, is somewhere in some range where you really don't want your grades to be. So then you add everything to everybody's grade. Does that happen to you? <laughs> So, so you can do it with a module. You just add a fixed, a fixed number to everybody's grade. And, uh, and so this operation where you just shift the grade, it's an operation that makes the Grothendieck group, it, it's, it's a bunch of commuting. However many grades, however, so if, if you grade by m tuple of integers, you can shift any one of them. So there'll be an operation, m commuting operators on your Grothendieck group. So that makes this k group a module over m commuting and also invertible operators because if you shift, if you add something, if you add grade, so add, add something to a grade, everybody's grade, you can also subtract. Right? So in concretely, my, so my m's generator will be safe, say, so if I've, uh, if I've graded something by m tuple of integers, I have the Grothendieck group going to be a module over, over Laurent polynomials, Laurent polynomials in in M variables, and maybe say the last one shifts all the gradings by the add one point to the. Okay. So to see this, so non, so in our in our examples, what are possible non-trivial gradings? Is uh, well, if I take all matrices, just just nothing. Yeah. So similarly for permutations, but if I think of if I think of, of polynomials, then of course I can assign to each variable degree its own degree. So if I, I can grade my elements 
my algebra by degree in each polynomial. It will be by polynomials in n variables. This will be therefore graded by n tuple of integer. And now in my in the example of instance, the star example, this is this is a situation where I have polynomials and I also have permutation that permutes them. So if I want a grading, then I I cannot really assign a grade in the, a degree to each of these variables independently because my permutation is going to be permute them. But I can assign degree, like I can count degree in x. This will be well defined because permutation only permute x among x's. And I can de count degree in y's, and so this is also well defined because permutation only permutes y's among y's. And so this algebra is graded by z2, by the total degree in x and the total degree in y. Z2, Z2, you can, yeah, but it, yeah. So, and so then what would be this K groups? Let's just uh, look at an example. So, a basic fact about n by n matrices, the algebra of n by n matrices has only one representation, namely the defining representation. So, and everybody else is just a sum of n copies. In fact, it's not a, it's a, it's a category of representation that's very interesting. Everything, every, every representation, in some basis, you can write your matrix, it's just your matrix repeated so many times. So, the K group there is just integers. It tell, counts how many times you repeated your matrix. Now, uh, for symmetric group, things get interesting and small characteristic, but we, in this talk, we will take K to be a field of sufficiently large characteristic, and then, and then again, the same thing will happen. There's finitely many irreducible representation, and everything else can be written as just a block matrices of this irreducible representation. And the number of this irreducible representation is the number of partitions of the number n. So I'll define what partition is later. So <coughs> now with polynomials. So if you have a, a space with n tuple of, of commuting operators, each of which shift degree, some degree, by one. So if I have a finite dimensional space, and I have, have some grade, have finitely many gradings, and so that means each of these operators is not an, just n tuple of, it's not just an n tuple of commuting matrices, but it's in fact n tuple of commuting nilpotent matrices. You raise, you raise, you know, as soon as you, 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 is that clear? <laughs> so if, if there's only finitely many floors, and uh, every time you, something happens, you go up by one floor, then you'll be on the roof you know, somehow at some point. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so if I have finitely many, if I have n commuting, Neil point matrices, they're all going to have a joint eigen, eigenspace zero, joint, joint vector that they kill. Right. And we go by definition of the K group, as long as they have a submodule, this sub, you can write them in some space where there's a one by one block where this is just all zero. And so there's the, what is it, the, huh, the K group, the K group here is just, it's just this trivial representation which you can put in any degree you want. And to record the degree, to record the degree you, you precisely have this, you precisely have this, uh, this manner. And the, the star example is a combination of two and three where you have, it comes from irreducible, now that zero space can be an irreducible representation of symmetric group. Instead of a, in that zero space, it also permutation will have to act, and they'll ha they can act by some irreducible representation, and so what you get is is this thing repeated, so it's it's polynomials in two variables repeated partition many times, because that that clear? Okay. Anyway, we're in the second half of the talk. Where Or, uh, that's. And you, you wonder what this has to do with anything. And, 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 the, and the reason now, what does it mean to categorify monodromes? 
So monodromy, as we discussed, for, for in general, it's a bunch of matrices. For very special function, it's a bunch of matrices of special kinds. Namely, it's the ma they're matrices, the entries of which, the invertible matrices, the entries of which are Laurent polynomials in so many variables. And so this, to, to ask this to be categorified means to lift this to this much larger thing instead of just looking at the growth in the group, you look, in fact, so this is, these are, these are, these are automorphisms of the growth in the group, the invertible matrices over the ring, which is defined. But in fact, you ask for much more. You ask for automorphisms of the category. Well, derived as, I mean, in the talk where I've introduced complex number, I think I shouldn't introduce complex of module for fear of confusion. So it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, and so, so this is, you think, the, <laughs> you go here, this is a very complicated, the, the modules over this thing is a very complicated object. If you, you, if you forget all this, infor, all this information that's forgotten by the graph in the group, you just go here, you just, 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 just a pre, you know, pre-module over this ring of this rank. And so, you, you got tons, there's tons of inversible matrices here where very few automorphisms of the category. And so to say, to say that the monodromy actually lifts here, it provides you, provides you with, a, with a very, very powerful handle on what's gonna happen. It's just, like I said, here, this, in this world, you could have written anything you want. If you, if you, go, if you go in this world, there's, there are very few things you can write. In fact, it's a miracle. Any time you have a derived, we have a whole talk in this conference about two things being derived equivalent. And any time you have a non-trivial derived equivalence, it's already kind of a miracle. That, that. So now if you fell asleep when I was talking about um, double order strings, you can ask, well, how can this possibly be useful to, to what we mean? Ten minutes? No, oh, perfect. So maybe like I have three transparencies left. So, so, so remember I, that at the at the at the at the beginning of the lecture I, I mentioned that in particular the uh, result of computation string theory is a sum of infinite series. Uh, so okay. So I, since I have that transparency, I have to somehow justify having it here. Um, so we'll work with. Topological strings. So topological strings, they instead of considering the path integral of all possible maps to your, some tar to your target space, they all, been in one incarnation, they only do holomorphic maps from, from, so this is now considered as a Riemann surface, and it's a holomorphic map to an algebraic variety. There's a lot of research in, in, in the case when this algebraic variety is Calabria, but it doesn't need to be. You can, this can be studied for any, for any thing, as long as x is a smooth threefold. So x is a smooth algebraic threefold. Now, the main point about that is that this, this, this sort of path integral in topological string is finite dimensional integral as, as um, as soon as you bound the genus and the degree of your curve. The degree here means roughly the area of the image. So, so it's a degree also in the sense of algebraic geometry, but it's also, it's also the area in the sense of differential geometry. And so it's also, for example, the energy of, of the, the actual, actual, actual action of the string. So it makes sense to, it makes sense while we're summing, well, we, overall general we're going to sum, but in terms of energy or degree, it, it makes sense to bound. And do some. Yeah. I mean, mo most most things in life are not we're not interested in in what happens at at the energies that we'll never achieve or some a certain degree. So, so we will sum. So this sum, this sum, this sum, this infinite sum that I was discussing, we will do over all genera, but for bounded area. Bounded energy, bounded degree. And like I said, that makes sense. 
And each term, each term in the sum will be then a finite dimensional integral. This is, this is, this is very, very complicated. The, the space of holomorphic maps are very hairy spaces. People who study them for life, they've, uh, they, they work hard. But they're finite dimensional things, so in particular mathematically, everything's defined. And so, very general conjectures, and there's a, there's a number of conjectures that imply this statement. And they're known in, in great many cases of interest. They imply that that function, that function I'm talking about, in fact, has analytic continuation. And that analytic continuation has singularities at rational multiples of 2 pi, where that denominator b is bounded in terms of degree. This is why I assume that degree is bounded. And and this will be monodromic in the sense of Riemann, and in that they'll have no monodromic. And in fact, the whole thing is a rational function of a variable z, which is exponential of i times the coupling constant. You see this? If I, if I take the exponential, these numbers will just go to root of unity. And it's, it's a rational function with cyclotomic denominators. And like I said, this is known in great many cases. And you just really, just really know. However, since this has no monodromy, why did I bring up monodromy? The, the, re the reason I've, I brought up monodromy is when you study these things, you should be able not to, like, you know, when you drive your car, it's fine. If you want to, if, if you're professionally, you know, like a professional car mechanics, you should, be open to you should be able to open the hood of your car and, you know, somehow know your way around, around there. The reason, the reason I'm bringing this up is that, is that I brought the monodromy up, is that the, while the whole thing has this remarkable singularity structure and no monodromy around it, the natural part of this, this is composed of, you know, it's, like a, you know, it has, it's like a car consists of, of uh, you know what it consists of. So in this part, they have the same singularities and, mo and interesting monodromy. It's only when you it's only when you you know take the whole thing that has no monodromy. The parts do. And so as an example, we'll take so so the way the way we model things in topological strings is that we take some modal geometries. Like for example, if I have like the image of this the image of the string could may may very well be some some holomorphic rational some rational curve, P1, Riemann sphere, inside your X. And to model what happens there, you can replace x by a, a vector bundle, just rank two vector points, like sort of, you know, the normal bundle to that sphere. So you take a, a local model, you take a, a rank two vector bundle over a sphere. But if you, if you, have a, if you want a, a useful way to locally model a global situation, what you should do, you should work equivalently with respect to all automorphism that that local situation has. And so in particular, since this geometry has a, an automorphism group of rank three, you should be, because you can scale the, the two, com even, you know, you know, in that. And so, and so, and so then you can do equivalent, this, this kind of, you can do the um, topological string counts equivalent with respect to two meaningful parameters. So there's, there's overall scale, so the three parameters up to overall scale, two will be meaningful. And what are the parts? The parts are, the parts would be if I just take this, take this sphere and cut it along the equator. So if I cut it along the equator, I get what do I get? I had, a, a, I had previously a Riemann sphere was mapping here. Sorry, some Riemann surface mapping here. Now I cut it. This this surface will have a boundary. And each each circle of that boundary will map with some multiplicity to that boundary circle here. Multiplicity meaning that if I fix a point on the boundary, this may have, for example, a one preimage on this circle and three preimages on that circle. And this numbers one and three will, will be a partition of the total degree of the map. The total degree is however many preimages a, a point has with multiplicity. 
So a partition is when you take a number and you decompose it as a sum of unordered terms. So for example, three plus one is partition of four. And so if, we, if we're studying maps of degree four, so this means a general point on this P1 has four preimages here, then, then, and we cut it, then we'll have to sum over all ways these four points may partition between boundary circles. Could be four, could be three plus one, could be two plus two, could be one plus one plus one plus one. Could be also two plus one plus one. And so the set of all possible functions you get this way is therefore nature labeled by partition of the degree. And this is a label. So three plus one is a label for my function. If I ch in ch instead choose four, or one plus one plus one plus one, this will be a different label for a different function. And the basic part of the Grom, Witten, Donaldson, Thomas package, which is known in this case, and it's known in, in, in some mind-boggling generality, this, these constituents out of which you glue the whole thing are, are in fact hypergeometric function of exactly that variable z we're discussing. So the, the, the whole thing, which before we cut, this was a rational function of this variable z. Z was, remember, z was like, oh, here I have definition. Z is the exponential of, of my coupling constant. But these are hypergeometric functions. And the hypergeometric function in the sense that you can associate a, a something like hypergeometric function to an algebraic variety. And this would be associated to something called the Hilbert scheme of points. And so then these things, these hypergeometric functions will have the monodromy I discussed. It'll be a, a partition matrices of the signs partition by partition with polynomials with Integer round, integer round polynomials in two variables with integer coefficients. This is because, I mean, it's a hypergeometric function depending on so many variables. You have two variables for the, for the rank of the automorphism minus one. And this, this functions, somehow, this functions, this, this partition many things, they will, the, these functions will transform among themselves as I go around all the singularities. And the monodromy, the, the, the monodromy of this object has a really beautiful categorification, namely, so this will be, I think I'll close to my last slide, so am I allowed to open just one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> namely, there were really deep insights in the subject uh, early on in the context of so, you know, I don't think I can mention everybody here. So very early on in the context of mirror symmetry, it was uh, Kantsevich who suggested that uh, the fundamental group of uh, something called Keller moduli space should act by zero optic equivalences. Um, then this, uh, there was a very, uh, this became, you know, somehow grew, grew more flesh, this idea grew more flesh in the work of uh, Bridgeland, where, um, where uh, this mechanism by which some fundamental groups act on, uh, on bidirectic equivalences was, like I said, it was just some kind of real mechanism there. And Bezro Kovnik has a, a theory, so Bridgeland has this th his theory of, of, of uh, this, this stability conditions. Bezro Kovnik has slightly alternative theory, which, which, which in fact very naturally ties to the, just directly ties to like questions in differential equations. So in fact, he produced, produced through the study of, you can read, representation theory of Chirednik algebras. He produced specific derived equivalences of the category we want. And then, um, and then it was the natural conjecture that this in fact match the, the monodromic differential equation. Maybe one name, I, one, one, one name I should write on the board since it's not there, the way to actually, the way the actual match goes, also, also there was an important side by Iritani on, or where the, so Iritani has a, this, we had this gamma functions in front of the, in front of the hypergeometric function. And so this, there's also important side there. And so these are very, like I said, this is a very interesting, this derived automorphism is a very interesting object, in particular it concludes this, Categorified in invariance of nodes, that some of you, well, to a certain, certain definite interest of that, that this and in previous string math conferences. 
And, um, and mathematical is quite challenging. However, this is, this is, this, so Roman, as recording of I've been working on this for at least since 2008. This is where these conjectures first uh, came into existence. And I, you know, I kind of think that we have a proof now because, but this is, uh, this is, previously we had some sort of proof to be that, that requires some categorical statements to be correct. And, uh, but now it's an actual, an actual proof. I'm not gonna, probably, I'm out of time to talk about how it goes. So I'll just, uh, I'll just wrap this around to the, to the end. Okay, thank you very much for this very beautiful story. I warned you, it would be tough. Um, there are two categories of humans, those who know what a category is, those who don't. And if you are in the first, like me, you're in good company. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's, let's take maybe uh, some, uh, some non-specialized questions. And uh, Professor Kunkov will give uh, another talk, or a couple of talks, I think, next week at the City of Poincaré. And you can also come to him for more technical uh, questions. And since we have to stick to the skill. Uh, Non-specialized question. Uh -huh. uh, your action is uh, of the symplectic origin or uh, kind of holomorphic? I, I, I expect that it's action by correspondences and some. No, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's hard to give it by correspondence. It's, it's the, the nature of this, uh, the nature of this derived equivalence is you, um, is you, is you think of uh, all these non-commutative algebras as, as different quantizations of the same thing, and they, uh, they, they're those, uh, I mean, you have to do it in like characteristic P and so forth, and so, but then, then you get, then you get, uh, then you get this action. I mean, this is, this is really, this is really hard stuff. Uh, when you were talking about the boundary maps, uh, do you think that somehow uh, could be related to some on Motobi maps or something? To what? On Motobi maps. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe. Okay, this is not in the category of non-expert questions. Yeah. So, in view uh, of, of time, I think uh, let's uh, thank again Andre for the beautiful talk. So we're going to, to take a break.